as the musical theater kid in me, we ever going to catch you on Broadway? Like, I'm just, why'd you laugh? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Catch me on Broadway. I was just like the phrase. (laughs) You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the interview portion of the Awards Tour podcast. I'm Jacqueline Coley, and I'm joined today by an Academy and Grammy winning producer, writer, all around, I think, musician, Mr. Ludwig Gorenson. Hello, sir. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to, nice to be here. I <laughs> know. We're here to talk about uh, this right here. This mm-hmm. is the Oppenheimer LP. This is for. I will go ahead and say, for Christopher Nolan to be on an executive produced track with you, it really says something of both about your producer ability and your scoring ability. Since we're here mostly to talk about that, I want to talk about that particular thing because it's not every director who chooses to be that intricately involved mm-hmm. in the score process from every aspect. Um, why do you think that is um, that is something that both you and Chris can do so well now in your second iteration, this idea of him being not just the director of the feature, but intricately involved in how you guys make the album. I think if you've seen any Chris Nolan movies, you know how important music is in his films. It's almost like its own character. Mm. And you can, you understand immediately what, what an ear he has for music and how much time you actually have to put in music to be able to put that in your films. And he's extremely engaged in the music music process from beginning to end. And also the way that he works with 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 the composer. When we get started, it's way early. It's way before we start shooting the film. I'm one of the first piece, uh, persons to get to read the script. Hmm. Right after the script, I sit down with him. We have a conversation. Talk about what kind of music he's hearing or is thinking. And, and then we start building the sound and the music world together. And it's a very, very, very close process. Uh, we sit down. We meet up in person once a week for about three months and I write five five minutes of music every week and we sit down, listen to it, talk about it, go through each composition very in a very detailed way, talk about specific sounds, we talk about melodies, we talk about the, the structure of the composition and then we pick and choose and, and, and create our own map of, 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 of music and sounds. Um, so when he starts shooting, he has about two or three hours of music ready to to listen to, and then I think he also also probably hears the music while he's shooting sometimes. And and sometimes I also get a call from set, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm thinking about this cue we're working on. Like, would you mind changing the end to make it more upbeat or uh, in a more deflated way?" Uh, so we constantly work on music up until we start actually working with the picture. I think that's so interesting. Do you ever, does he share it with the actors? Because there's a few scenes where I would feel the cues of the music are really the stage direction that the actor is working with. Is that something that also gets shared with them or is it really just you and Chris in those early in those early moments? I, I think it's mostly just me and Chris, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm sh- I also know Emma Thomas is listening on the music and Jennifer Lame, the editor, mm-hmm. uh, she hears the music early on too. When they're finished doing the film, Jennifer Lame and Chris starts kind of the, mo- uh, the movie together. And so they already had two or three hours of music to kind of start picking and choose from. Um, so when we have a first cut, all of the music in the first cut is our original score for the film. That's so crazy. The film has already had such an incredible run, both commercially and critically. You're waking up literally this morning to new Grammy nominations for the film, along with Wakanda Forever. I will say, obviously, having won um, the top prize at the Grammy Album of the Year and everything in between that you guys have done, uh, what is it like waking up to new Grammy nominations? And also, in one category, competing against yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's, It's I'm very fortunate to, to waking up to those kind of news and for people to think about the work you've done or listen to it or appreciate it is always uh, it's always a, a such a great thing to to experience and especially when you work on a project that reaches out to so many people mm-hmm. it's 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 not very often so when when that happens in your career you really have to you know it's it it really affects you in a different way because 
you, you're starting to get phone calls from people you haven't seen in a while or friends from, you know, I have friends back in Sweden that, that calls me and like, oh, we saw this movie or heard, heard of this music. And, and it's, it's, um, it's such a, it's a very interesting um, but beautiful experience. I really do love that. Um, I will say for Oppenheimer in particular, the nominations, it is coming from like, I think a very interesting moment with the film in the sense that Wakanda Forever was your last project and it's still in the same category as this, but you're really just sort of starting this journey, really talking about the score of Oppenheimer and everything that you've done. But before we sort of dive into it, I really want to talk about the collaborators that you've worked with up until this point. Because one of the things I think is so interesting is Grammy award-winning compositions, these billion-dollar franchise movies. But I really wonder, when you were playing in the Fabulous Five mm -hmm. quartet, mm -hmm. was this the goal? Was this always the, the focus? Was it, was it like that way back then? Or was this a deviation from your original musical aspirations? Because that jazz... That jazz five sum is very different <laughs> than, than any of these things. <laughs> the, the Fabulous Five quintet. Quintet, sorry, that was quintet. <laughs> uh, it was a very, very special time in my life. Uh, that was, I had, I started the Royal College, of, Royal College of Music in Stockholm. And it was the first time I experienced myself not being the best in my class at my instrument or my abilities of music. And so it was a kind of wide eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was def it was a very difficult time because I was always used to kind of being the yeah, the, the best on guitar and the best, and this was in, in, in this occasion. I was I was uh, amongst the the people that 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 were a little that needed to. Um, I felt like I had a lot to prove, and so my first two years of co of college, I spent a lot of time just by myself and practicing, and feeling like I had to get better on my instrument instrument and getting better in improvising because my major was also jazz performance, and then my last year. Of college, I started this group called Fabulous Five, um, and we made a record. I made a record, uh, had some great musicians with me, and we won competitions. and And people were like, "Oh, I didn't know you did this. I didn't know." So I was like, "It was a very cool, nice end of my college experience." <laughs> nice end. I just that was like important for me to 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 prove to myself that I wanted to achieve. This in education in in Sweden at the time one of the highest most impressive things you can do was to to go to this program and play jazz and and I wanted to get as as good I, as I could on my instrument as possible. Well, I would say um, you've definitely done pretty well. One of the things you also see is um, even though you've done all these records, seeing you perform them is a rare thing. Obviously, when you go on tour with some of your artists, you're out there with them. But mostly what I was able to look at is like you on like Jimmy Kimmel or you on The Tonight Show. Is that something? Because now with all of the music scores that you've done, all of the television, and as well as the like hit records, you could definitely do what like Hans Zimmer is doing right now. And I do think it's a different time in music when I was listening to like James Horner and and um, Goldsmith and obviously uh, John Williams. Obviously, you could think about a concert with them, but those were just so few and far between. And now these guys are going on tour. But I also figure right around the time you could go on tour, you're too busy to do it. And you also have young children. Is that is that part of it? Because I have to feel the guy that toured with the Fabulous Five. Like you want to get back to that at some point, maybe. I think so. I mean, I w one of my favorite things was to play for is to play for live live audience and i remember when i moved when i did the move 2007 to la and to america which i'd never been to the states before uh, and i moved to start my career and my studies as in film scoring and i thought that i had to put everything else aside my my live shows my you know trying to play in a band my producing and i just put all that aside and just focus on a singular thing which mm -hmm. was film scoring um, and so I realized pretty early on, though, that, you know, I met Childish Gambino, I met Donald Glover through my first TV show, Community, and he wanted to, to uh, he wanted me to help out produce some of the music, and we wrote music together, and then I put the band together for the live shows, and we started touring, and, and I realized that maybe my strong card was that I actually could do all these things together that I wanted to do. And I mean, obviously, I saw how Donald did it. He was a, a writer. He was an actor. He was a musician. And so I was like, "Why?" I mean, if, if he does that, I can be a 
composer, a producer, a, a musician, play live. And, and, and also one of my childhood dreams, from always playing guitar as a, as a kid, was also obviously to play for big, large audiences and big festivals and all, the, all over the world. And, and I got to do that with the, with the Childish Gambino band. And um, that was some beautiful memories. And um, I was so happy that I was able to incorporate all these worlds together. Well, I'm going to be waiting out for a set at Coachella with Ludwig Göransson, and then you can bring everybody out. You can bring out Rihanna. You can bring out Adele. It'll be fabulous. It'll be, it'll be the greatest day. And I think looking at the folks that you've worked with and the fact that there are frequent collaborators, I guess it wouldn't appeal to you really to feel more of like a hired gun. Like you prefer in every aspect of creation for it to be collaborative because that's not always the case in scoring. I mean, sometimes the director and the person that's doing the composition barely talk mm -hmm. after um, – after the initial couple meetings and they maybe work independently and just check in with each other here and there. I, I guess that would not, that would be a pretty unappealing aspect of making films if, if that was the case with the director. I, like it, I think that'd be an automatic no for you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm already spending so much time by myself writing the music <laughs> and sitting in my studio and, and you need to feel something that, you need to feel like you're getting something back. That's always important to me. Feel like I'm growing as a person. Feel like I'm growing as a composer. Feel like I'm learning something from the people I'm working with. And in this case, working with 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 like you said, with Donald and Ryan and Chris, I always feels like they give me so much. That's why I'm I feel extremely lucky to be working with true artists. Let's talk about working with those true artists. For folks that haven't seen Oppenheimer, which I really hope at this point they have on the largest screen possible. One thing, as I was getting ready for this, I went back and, and watched the film, and I'm actually looking at um, what you guys have here um, in the in the album, as well as what was written in the script. And one scene in particular, when I watched it this time, I I got so um, intrigued by the fact that it is the idea of when you watch a Chris Nolan film, you have to watch it twice. And it's the opening scene when Strauss is meeting Oppenheimer. And it, it's a very innocuous scene when we first see it because it's just them and they're greeting and it's like, hi, come welcome. And everything in the dialogue is this is a happy meeting between mm -hmm. these men who are colleagues. Maybe Oppenheimer is a little cold, but this is just a very matter of fact. Yeah. The scoring underneath that, as I went back and listened to it, is so mischievous and 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 depressed and like it is just it is like if you were inviting over an in-law that you hated the music <laughs> is in that moment and it, I feel it is speaking to the fact that we know by the time we get to the film that Strauss is not like Oppenheimer in that scene we don't know it at the time but the music is telling us that because maybe Oppenheimer like, break that whole thing down, because I had a whole story that I wrote about both Oppenheimer thinking that Strauss was evil, and the music is telling us that he knows he's evil, and, and then Strauss being depressed about it. And I felt like that was all there in the score, so I hope I'm right. <laughs> I think for that moment when you see Strauss for the first time, it's not you don't see Strauss for the first time, but Strauss is meeting Oppenheimer for the first time. I think that's, part, I think that's the sweetest music in the film. Actually, really? yeah. Really? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's also there there's all also hints of something of a mystery there that there's they give a little taste uh -huh. that there's there's a mystery involved in this which is portrayed by the harp and the harp is playing um, Strauss theme, but the chords and the soft strings under it is kind of making it feel a little lush and like don't worry about this we're you know we're this is about this is a good friendship but there's always something kind of that makes you lean in and sitting on the edge of your seat oh see that's what i was just about to say i, I when i was watching it the one thing i took from it is this is not what it seems there's a little bit of under cord underneath that uh i would say that pairs also very nicely with the scene where that officially becomes real which is a lowly salesman let that that, mm -hmm. that scoring underneath that scene because in the first time you read that um Oppenheimer says to Robert Downey Jr.'s character, Strauss, um, you were just a lonely salesman. And he's just like, no, just a salesman. And that sort of like bite back. Talk about that one. Because again, going back and looking at the film, those first 15 minutes hit so much incredibly harder because of the scoring choices underneath these seemingly innocuous scenes. Absolutely. And I think that's with Chris's films, how he ties the whole journey together. Yeah. It's, 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 it, the whole end ties in, in with the beginning. And the details in the filmmaking, and how you can, and how we also put the details of that 
in the score as well. We're hinting on things that you hear on later. And the more you watch the film and the more you listen to the music, the more you can, the more you understand. And that's so interesting. How do you keep that sort of straight? Because it's like what you say, you bring in certain folks themes as illusions. Is that something that you are taking the song and you're saying, OK, we specifically want to make sure these characters have hero moments within this moment? Or is it something that is a little bit more felt through as to when you bring in the various themes? Because when Oppenheimer's theme comes in in certain moments, also when the theme attached to Florence's character comes in when she's not even on screen and and stuff like that. Um, Is that mapped out sort of in the script where Chris says, hey, I would like this, this sort of emotion or this color to come in more? Or is it just sort of felt through? No, I would say that Chris maps, Chris does an incredible job with mapping out the music on the first director's cut. Really? Yeah, because we've already taught, we've, we've written, we have about three hours of music. And we have a, 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 an idea of where the music will go and for who. You know, we have Strauss, we had Strauss theme, we had Oppenheimer's theme. And then when, we, when Chris and Jennifer Lame goes and starts making the first cut, they're really good. Chris and Jen does really good work on mapping the themes out for different characters and putting the music at the right places. And then when I see it, it's, it's an incredible experience for me. To just, obviously, you see, get to see a, a, a Chris Olin movie, movie for the first time, but also hear the music that you've been working on together for a long time and see it, how it comes to life. Mm-hmm. And But that's also, after that moment, that's when my job really starts because a lot of the music stays in those places, but then there's a lot of themes that we still need. Like we didn't have Kitty's theme. Like we were, we didn't have a theme for that happy Strauss moment. Like we had the Strauss theme, but we didn't have, we didn't know how to make it in a sweet kind of mystery vibe in the beginning. So after I see the first cut, that's when I bring all that music with me back to the studio and we start really sketching out and mapping out what's missing, where are we gonna put it, how are we gonna carve out the themes and carve out the score and makes it flow into each other and and it's really it's a lot of it's a lot of work mm. and and we work Monday to Thursday and then on Fridays we watch the movie wow and we keep doing that every week for I think three or four months when do you guys sit down to do the final master recording which I know is one of your favorite parts is when you finally get to I don't know how many pieces were attached to this one was it how many? How big was the was the orchestra that you guys assembled for this one? I think it was a forty six piece string orchestra. Wow! And then we had some additional brass for another day, like a brass session, and then harp. Wow! So after you assemble all that, when w- at what point do you finally sit down? Is it with the? Because everyone does their scoring sessions differently. Are you guys doing it directly to projection through screen, or how do you set up your scoring sessions? Because I do feel it's sort of like. Um, with an actor, what they choose to do with their marks and everything else. For Oppenheimer, we had, we, I started recording very early. And the first note that Chris had on the music, the first idea he had on the score was to use the violin as portraying Oppenheimer's um, personality and, uh, and his emotional state. And he also knows that uh, Serena, my wife, is an incredible violinist. And so he knew that we could also probably get started on that very early and we did and i was that was a very lucky situation for me to be able to work with her and she's a very accomplished violinist and we were experimenting the first couple of weeks with just like microtonality uh doing small little glissandos up and down in Mm -hmm. in different clusters because that was something that was interesting to, to chris and i uh how we can use these old because a lot of times when you think about strings and violins and especially in the way it's been used in cinema and especially in horror films having these like string clusters and and the the shock moments of that of that abrasive sound but how can we take that approach but turn it around and instead of maybe use a string cluster and have it be very abrasive and 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 scary sounding but then within a split second change the glissandos uh to something beautiful and melodic and romantic and with, with a beautiful uh, slow vibrato and how you can how you can go in between those emotions in a really interesting and different way yeah and like for example when you see you know there's that beautiful scene when uh, when uh, Oppenheimer is sitting in, in the courtroom and he's 
telling basically his wife sitting behind him and he's telling the story about how he cheated on her with um, Kitty and Gene, right? Yeah, Gene Tatlock. Yeah. He's basically telling the story. His wife is sitting behind him and he's telling the story how he cheated on her with, with Gene Tatlock. And the music that's coming in there is like these like almost yeah, almost like a horror movie, these glissandos and like you like you're like, what's happening? And then you see him naked and then but then the way this Glissanos ends is like in a beautiful chord with the lush vibrato. And so you say it's going in between those painful moments in, in a in neurotic way. Yeah, that is the scene that was definitely talked about there. Again, it's um, it's the careful instruments because that's almost a thriller-like moment. The music makes it as much more tense in that moment because he is matter of fact in the way that he's saying it, but we know this is a very heart-wrenching thing. It's very similar to the act that the film I say is a thriller to people who don't believe me. I'm like, yes, I understand that it's a long movie, but trust me when I say this, you feel the tension in so many aspects of it. And another scene I know where you felt that is also a scene where you told me it was very difficult for you guys to find the scoring behind it. And that is the moment in the gymnasium after the drop when Oppenheimer is essentially being celebrated and he's feeling this out-of-body experience with celebration for what he's created. And, and it's the beginning of him questioning his creation I think that scene I was surprised for you to say that it took so long because it is so powerful but also it feels so organic so talk to me how you guys eventually found that and why it was so difficult to find that scene and what would work with it it's interesting because I've been thinking about that for for a while now and um and as I'm taking a little step back from I mean this was we finished a movie about eight or nine months ago and I I'm kind of now was like realizing the depths that I had to go through to find the music for the character and how that affected me at the time that I didn't realize. Um, because the music is embodying him and you, the music has to come from his eyes, from his mind, and you have, you, the audience is sitting, feeling everything through him. Mm. And that the only way to get that, make that happen was to for me to do the same thing, obviously. Um, and and there's a lot of things that I, I themes that I felt like I really connected with him on, like the feeling of of, of how he feels, kind of loneliness and and no one's understanding him, and and this kind of especially in the beginning of the movie, where he's where his first theme starts, where Oppenheimer gets introduced, it's 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 when he's like when he's a student and he's, and the theme is is, to me about loneliness, and and you hear this one violin playing this the melody and accompanied by just a, um, this kind of synth bass. But then the journey that that eventually takes and how he goes into these that scene, for example, where he's, his whole world is just shuddering. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading the script and, and, and reading about that and how that, that had a, such a powerful effect on me because I could not even imagine how that would feel like and imagine that he would go through the, something like that. And I think why it took the longest is just because it was it's such a complicated feeling that I've never that's so far away from from anything that I've ever experienced. And it took me a while before a long time before I could actually understand and kind of really go through what what some I'm not saying that was close to what he was doing, but 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 go through that that difficult time. Um, and and it was it was also not fun to feel like to yeah. go through those feelings either. So that's why it took the longest. We we didn't finish that cue, that piece of music, until one of the very last days of, of the dub stage. Wow! And I remember when we did it because Chris was like, "You nailed it." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you, it was it felt like you felt like you ran a marathon. It's like, oh, we're done. We're done. We don't have to keep working on it. No, but it was it was it was. I was connecting that. What I think what was solved the puzzle was I was connecting it to. A piece that's earlier in the movie when you a music cue that's called gravity swallows light and it's in a scene where he visits los alamos for the first time with lawrence and his brother and you see this beautiful shots of the stars and like getting swallowed in black holes and that's one of the first times you hear these synthesizers that feel like they're just grabbing you down in a downward spiral and they're 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 to me that's that was my thought about that was that the synthesizers would channel the the, the impending doom, mm. and somehow it clicked to me like like let's bring that feeling and those emotions back into this the scene that we're talking about. I love listening to artists talk about their moments of inspiration, and I think 
it's always so interesting where it comes from. Sometimes it's a random moment at the grocery store. Sometimes it's this moment that you recreate from your life so you can get into the emotions of a different moment. Uh, I would say that there have probably been incredible ones throughout your career. Can you just give me a hint on maybe one of the strangest places you received inspiration in the sense that, like, I do not need to be thinking about this melody right now. I've got other things going on, but I got to go write it down because it's there. Or maybe something that you would have not thought inspired a piece of work in the way that it did, like a sound of a one of, one of the composition people I talked to said that it was a kid's squeaky toy, mm-hmm. gave him the first melody <laughs> that he could then, like, layer through to make the beat of the song so do you have anything like that i feel like there's so many things <laughs> like i feel like there's so many things like that um i i just i i feel like because i to me i get i, I get a lot of inspiration and just being able to write music and I, i'm able to write music from creating and sounds and creating my own sounds and taking taking familiar sounds and then manipulate them into something else or taking things from the environment or from a like in Crete with like a boxing gym and taking those sounds and making that into music. And so so for me, this hearing sounds and creating sounds is a very big part of my process and using that to be able to create, write melodies or create music is very important. So for Oppenheimer, um, the way I wanted to start this score, because I also, when I start scoring any project or when I start writing songs or anything, I always wanted to feel like I'm doing something for the first time. So any any movie or TV show that I've been doing, I've, I'm always trying to do it in a different way to not feel like I'm repeating myself. Um, and but for Oppenheimer, what was what I wanted to start with was the emotional core, and not trying to hide with sounds or production because that's also easy to do. Was like if you get if you have some really cool sounds or some technology or production ideas, like it's easy to kind of also sometimes hide behind that. And but I knew as soon as I read the script that we need to get the emotional core right. We need to get the themes right. We need to get the the melody and the the harmony and the the, the heartstrings right. And and also I knew if we, if we if we did that, if we had a good uh, seed with with that information, it would be easy to put in the production and put in the synths and the electronics. That would that would that would be the easy part. Well, I would say mission accomplished. Um, before we get out of here, I want to start with where it began because I, I love this about Christopher Nolan is he is a he's a cinephile through and through, but more importantly, he is a student of everyone that he works with. Mm. Um, he is always careful to study anything that they do and say, hey, this is something that I saw that you did that really inspired me. And I love the story of the first thing that he saw with you that sort of brought you to his attention and eventually to your collaborations through Tenet. So I'd love for you to share that because I think it's it's such a great story that, first of all, where he saw it, the fact that he like calls up Ryan for the ticket, again, it's a great, it's a great tale. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that way, the way I know I knew about it first was because Ryan Kruger told me this and it was at the premiere for Creed, the first Creed film. And I think Ryan had invited Chris Nolan and, and Emma Thomas at a premiere, and they showed up, loved the movie, and Ryan got a little chat with him after the after the film, and and one of the questions that Chris Nolan asked was who scored the film, and Ryan was like, yeah, it's my 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 friend Ludwig Göransson, and he told me Ryan told me about this a couple of days later, and I was like, oh, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. I, I, obviously, I didn't think that anything was going to come out of it and other than the, the flattering question about who scored this film they must have liked the music um so but here we are now <laughs> here you are <laughs> two movies later and hopefully more thank you so much for this i you are a be- very busy man i think i'd be remiss if i didn't ask what folks can look out for you next because i i'm sure you're in here writing something right now <laughs> <laughs> um i think next will be my own music i mean i've been working on it for 6 years now so Hopefully I'll have some, I, I do have some time now where I can think I can finish it, so. All right. As the musical theater kid in me, we ever going to catch you on Broadway? Like, I'm just, why'd you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, catch me on Broadway. I was just like the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, I think, I think you're getting closer to that EGOT status anyway. I just, I want to know if it, if the aspirations for you to write a, lo- like a lovely romantic, uh, uh, musical is up there because I would listen. I would. <laughs> you know, uh, you never know. I I do anytime like I go to see a musical. Uh, most of the times I get very inspired 
because I, I love I love that um, the stage and I love that scene. Um, and whenever I go, I get to get inspired, but but probably will take a little time before you see me there. All right, yeah. all right. I know Adele won't do it, so I'm never going to ask her. All right, that's it for us. Um, I want to thank you so much, and I want to remind everyone that Oppenheimer is available for voting in all categories, and be sure to check out the album. It's awesome. Grammy-nominated. Thank you so much, Ludwig. Thank you. <laughs>